Strong Against God by Fernando Franco Felix Chapter 1 I was a priest back then, so I was pretty nervous about anyone watching me going into a brothel. Not that anyone would have stopped me, of course, but they would have judged me and I could not give an explanation. For some reason, I was even wearing a clerical shirt and a collar identifying me as a priest. I just have to remind myself I was not doing anything wrong. I was serving Jesus and I should never be ashamed of that. So I entered. The receptionist looked at me, but she didn't say anything. I crossed the lobby and took out the piece of paper where I had written the information. They were waiting for me in room 22. I looked around, figured out how the rooms were arranged, and I found a room. I stood there, feeling my heart racing, thinking it wasn't too late to run away. But I found some courage and knocked on the door. It opened automatically. There were four people spread over the room. They nearly seemed to be posing for an album cover. I didn't know their names back then, but I know them now. Sahira was short and angry. She was leaning against a corner. Oakley was lying on a bed. She was throwing a ball in the air and catching it to pass the time. Kalfan, a muscular man, was standing there, seeming half amused and half irritated, looking directly at me. Finally, in front of Kalfan, sitting on a chair directly oppos opposite to the door, was June. He was a fit Asian man. He was looking directly at me, and in his sight I could see a threatening confidence. I stood there, frozen. Father Jacob, June said, greeting me. It is a pleasure to finally meet you. Please, come in. I came in, and the door closed automatically. It's uh, Jacobo, actually, like Hobo, but without the H and with a hack before it. Uh, Jacob will be fine. <laughs> okay, June replied and laughed as if my shyness had charmed him. You'll forgive us if we don't introduce ourselves. It's part of the job. Of course, I replied. I forgive everyone. It's part of my job. By all means, take a seat. He said, pointing at a chair next to the door. So, what's the job, father? Father, said Sahira, busily confused. You are supposed to call Christian priest father, Jun explained. You are making that up, claimed Oakley, finally ignoring her ball. It's true, explained Kalfan, but female priests are called sister, not mother. You are half right, I replied, but Kalfan interrupted me. We don't care, he said with the biggest smile I had seen on anyone's face. That's fine, here's the job. I need you to find a person on Earth. Yoon raised an eyebrow. That can be quite challenging. Earth is a large, lifeless place. I mean, it's hard enough to find a person in a moon or a space station, and those are easier to survive and considerably smaller. Don't worry, I know where he is. Getting to him is the problem. I see. And once we find this man... What should happen to him? Nothing! You should not hurt him. We want to rescue him from Earth. This is a very important person. His name is Carlos Sanchez Lee, but he's better known as Linus II. He's a priest. More than a priest, in fact. Have you ever heard of the Pope? I have. He's a sort of high-ranking priest, right? Like a general in an army? Yes, kinda. He is the most high-ranking priest, in fact. He is the representative of God on Earth. Oakley laughed out loud, very amused at the idea. Then Sahira spoke. Isn't the Pope supposed to be, like, super old? She's right, intervened Kalfan. He might not be alive anymore. In that case, I will pay you anyway, I promised. Now that you mention it, June said, our contact assured us that you could pay, but... How did you come to have so much money? Well, mostly it was given to me by rich people, or even poor people. Many were not even Christians. I told them about my quest and why it was important. They believed in me. This man is very important. He will restore the church. John raised a hand and lowered his face. He was asking me to stop. We don't question our clients' motivations. 
and we prefer not to know them. We will find this man for you. Just tell us where to find him. My heart was racing once more. This was it, the moment of truth. There's one more thing. This has been a deal breaker with other mercenary companies. Prolapse it out, Kalfan ordered me. I need to go with you. Not possible, Kalfan replied immediately. We can do business with you. They all stood up, ready to leave, except Yoon. He raised one hand and they stopped. Why? Yoon asked. It's hard to explain to people who are not Christians, but blessings are important. Blessings? Asked Kalfine, smiling again. Yes, I explained. When you become a priest, you receive a sacred blessing that gives you divine authority, like the authority to appoint other priests. The priest who blessed you received his blessing from another priest, and he from another, all the way back thousands of years into the past until you reach Jesus blessing the twelve apostles and ordering them to go around the world promoting the good news. So you see, it is a blessing that comes directly from God himself. So? Well, if you find Linus II and he is dying or he cannot get to space for some reason, we would need someone to be blessed with his divine authority so that it is not lost and the church can have a leader to rebuild it until a new college of cardinals can be established and a new pope can be elected. Sahira laughed. <laughs> and that someone would be you? She said. Uh, yes. How convenient, she replied. But without taking his eyes off of me, June scolded her. We don't question our client's motivation, Sahira. Then his attitude changed as he talked to me again. Father Jacob, I know, I know, there is no place for tourists here. Don't worry, I'll stay out of your way. No. The four mercenaries again stood up and walked towards the door. I will pay you twice your fee, I said, desperate. I would love that, June admitted. But we can't do business. He was about to touch the door. I can be useful. June stopped and turned back to see me. I don't wish to insult you, father, but what abilities could you have that would be useful in our line of work? I can fight. Everyone can fight. Before I was a priest, uh, I can fight hand-to-hand -hand combat, and I am really good at it. I felt someone looking at me. I turned to see. It was Oakley. Let's see, she said. June, Kalfan, and Sahira moved to one corner of the room. Oakley stood on one side, and I stood on the other. Oakley pulled out a knife, first with the point up, and then doing one quick single-handed movement to turn the point down. Kalfan reached for his own knife to give it to me. As annoying as he was, he believed in fair fights. No thanks, I said to him. This serves to prove my point. Kalfan was gladly surprised by this development, and he put away the knife. And the fight started. Oakley moved quickly towards me and tried to stop me, but I easily dodged her and pushed her in the mouth. She began bleeding from her lower lip. I could see the respect in her eyes. Then she tried a bunch of different attacks in quick succession. She stabbed, she slashed, switched hands, but I stopped, dodged, or countered her attacks constantly. My mind was not on that fight. My mind was on one of those days in my childhood spent in the pit, surrounded by vague figures. Were they cheering? Screaming? I couldn't tell. Another kid tried to stab me in the stomach. I intercepted the hand and held it firmly, just as I did with Oakley when she tried the same thing. Then I tried bending her arms towards her and stabbed her with her, with her own knife. But instead, she let go of the knife and grabbed it in the air with her other hand, used to immediately try the slashing motion towards my neck. I used my foot to move, her, to move one of her feet and make her lose balance. She fell, but she succeeded in slashing my upper left leg, forcing me to move back and allowing her to get back on her feet. Then Oakley again advanced towards me, trying a lot of quick attacks, but I block or dodge most of them, although I did get a few cuts in my arms. 
She was doing a lot of erratic twitching motions. She hoped to make me react in one direction and attack in another, but I didn't fall for it. She had me against the wall. I couldn't dodge or avoid her attacks any longer. She again tried to stab me and I stopped her hand and then I stopped the other so she couldn't use the same trick as last time. It was a matter of strength now. And it was clear to everyone I was strong. Enough, June declared. You know what you are doing, but is that all you can do? Any firearm experience? Military training? No, this is all I know. I learned as a child because... Calvin interrupted me. No need. You don't have to tell us how you know what you know. Thanks, I didn't want to. Oakley was opening and closing her hand. I had bruised her wrist. None of us wants to, she reassured me. Was that enough to convince you? I asked June. I'll still pay you double. No. Triple? Leaving the brothel was just as embarrassing as entering it, even if the receptionist was the only one there to see me. I tried to ignore her and I hoped she would ignore me too, but she saw where my leg was bleeding and she smiled. Had a good time, didn't you, father? I stopped for a second. I opened my mouth to say something, but I thought better of it and decided to just walk away. We hope to have you back, she said laughing at her own dumb joke, but then she realized something important and her attitude changed. Hey, for real, wait. I sighed. Yes? Could I have your contact? I'm not interested. Jesus was friends with many prostitutes, she reminded me. I closed my eyes and breathed deeply. My leg hurt, my jeans were getting soaked in blood near the wound, and she was right. Sure, just please don't, just use it seriously, okay? Sure, sure, only serious things, she said in a mocking tone of voice. I was sure nothing would, go, would come out of this, but I took out my cell phone, navigated to the menus, and she showed me her cell phone with the notification, new contact received. I walked out of the brothel into a dark alley, but looking up I could see lights, buildings and streets. It occurs to me that many of you have probably never been in a space station. I'll explain. Most space stations are huge cylinders. This one, Asteroid Station, was around 10 kilometers long and 2.5 kilometers in diameter spinning to simulate gravity so that up points towards the center of the cylinder and down points towards the walls of the cylinder. The city was built inside the cylinder and for that reason it looked over you and when you looked up you only saw buildings and streets or maybe parks and of course the spine of the station. This is a long rod extremely strong, going through the center of the cylinder and connected to it by a few equally strong columns people call ribs. The spine is not only used for structural support, it also carries all the services and utilities like water, electricity and air filtration, but more importantly it was covered in long light producing stripes, otherwise the station would be completely dark. In that moment, the lights were fairly dim because the intensity of the lights is modulated to simulate day and night. But in a 26-hour cycle instead of 24, I'm not sure why. To be honest, I was double-guessing myself, thinking of the deal I had proposed to the mercenaries. They told me they would think about it, but part of me was scared, hoping they would not accept. I was so lost in my thoughts I did not see the man and the woman playing chess on the sidewalk. I was just barely aware they were using a bunch of crates and boxes as improvised, improvised tables and chairs, but they certainly noticed me. Then I saw a beaten down vending machine, boasting of being able to print 50,000 different items. I decided to take a look at its catalog and after a short while I decided to print myself a pack of cigarettes and a lighter. I had not smoked in years, but I thought it would help me calm down. Only then I noticed the two people looking away from their game and paying a lot of attention to my cigarettes being printed. I didn't think much about it and picked them up when they were done. Turns out they had paper covering both ends of the cigarette. That's what I get from using cheap vending machines. But no problem, I ripped the paper from both ends. At that point, the people playing chess stood up. 
I grab my lighter and turn on my cigarette. It's illegal to smoke here. Go to your ship. The woman told me, very angry. Illegal? I asked her, amused. This is a pirate base. Everything here is illegal. You are polluting everyone's air, the man screamed at me. This ain't no fancy ship whose filter you can fuck up. Stop smoking. I reluctantly and growlingly turned out my cigarette without even using it once. Fine, I conceded. I was very stressed. I had just had a very difficult day and now my one relief had been denied from me. Not a good mood, not a good mood to make decisions then. You have to follow the laws of Astrid Station while you are here, the man said, threateningly. Laws? I questioned him. Everyone here is a pirate or a mercenary. We are all criminals. What's one cigarette? Too much, the woman sentenced. Fuck you, I whispered. Now you are too much, the man replied. The woman tried to hit me in the crotch, but I moved back to avoid her knee and instead punched her in the face so fast she had no time to react. The man drew his arm back for one strong punch, probably hoping to knock me out, but I was already using my foot as a hook to lift one of his feet and make him fall on his back. The woman grabbed their board, knocking all the pieces to the ground, and she was about to hit me with it. Hit him! Kalfan cheered, with a huge smile on his face. Do not hit him, Oakley replied, not amused by Kalfan's joke. He was smoking, the woman complained. He's an idiot, Kalfan assured them. Leave him with us. Oakley asked diplomatically, and they seemed to agree. The woman started picking up the pieces, but the man turned to me one last time. May you learn the importance of the law. That was my first blessing in this quest. The, pi the pirates sat back to start a new game, and we three walked away. I thought your religion was all about letting people hoard you or something like that, Calfan commented. It's all about love, I explained. And I thought to myself, what could people like you understand about love anyway? Then I continued to explain, but I am a flawed human and I lost my temper. Uh, so it's a good thing it's all about forgiveness too. The station laws are not about forgiveness though, Oakley warned me. So better not break them, maybe? What's all this about laws? I was exasperated. This is a pirate base, right? We are all breaking the law simply by being here. According to some laws that are imposed on people, sure, Calvin agreed. But not according to our laws, the ones we all agreed to. I was very confused. And Oakley must have noticed it. So she explained. Astrid used to be a station like the others. Then, when the supply ships just stopped one day, back when Earth got messed up, people here needed water, food, and raw materials, so they offered pirates a place to dock and make repairs in exchange for those things. But when you invite pirates, mercenaries, and other violent people, things can get volatile. The only way to keep this arrangement is if we all agree to follow certain rules, certain laws. Sure, they are not the laws of the moon colonies, orbital cities, nor merchant corporations, but they are the laws we set for ourselves. This place actually has a constitution. Really? What does it say? I just read it once, but the usual. Do not kill anyone in the station, do not damage the station, do not fuck anyone for free, don't smoke in public air, common decency. Who enforces those rules? We get together every so often to vote for the mayor. That's impressive, I admitted. In my experience with violent people, there's someone who makes all the rules, gives all the orders, and people obey, no matter what. Kalfan laughed. <laughs> and does this criminal organization still exist? No. Exactly. Then we stopped in front of a restaurant. Finally, Kalfan exclaimed. Well, thanks for helping me, but my hotel is farther down that way. Oakley grabbed my wrist, in a friendly manner this time. Yeah, but we thought we'd invite you to eat something. It got kinda intense with a knife back there, but it was purely professional. 
I want you to feel welcome with us. She wanted me to feel welcome? These people who have been clearly following me since I left our meeting? These people who would kill or save anyone for the right amount of money? But I had to follow Jesus' example. Um, yeah, sure, thank you both. I don't care how you feel, Calfan clarified. At least he was honest. I'm just here because I'm the medic of the team and I have to take a look at that leg. That's the law in our team. Thanks anyway. We entered the restaurant. It was late, so it was more of a pub at that hour, populated by long criminals drinking alone, and they seemed annoyed by our intrusion. We sat at a table and it lit up with a menu, but I had to clean the table of scraps and dust to be able to read it. Calfan selected something almost without looking, like he knew the menu by heart, while Oakley read everything care carefully and with anticipation. I read a little and found something that caught my eye. What's a... Uh, we... with la... with la coche? A kind of mushroom, Oakley explained. It is delicious. Okay, I'll have that. Leg, Calfan ordered. I extended my leg so that Calfan could check it. He took a pair of scissors from somewhere in his clothes and he used them to make the cut in my pants a little longer so he could see the wound better and start cleaning it. So, Oakley said, you mentioned the money was granted to you by wealthy donors. How did that happen? Did they contact you? Well, it's a long story. Calfan put aside the scissors and pulled a bottle of disinfectant from a pocket in his jacket. We are just trying to find out if you are someone else's middleman. Come on, man, Oakley complained. I was getting there. If you don't like how I do things, do it yourself. Calfan smiled. I just did. He sprayed disinfectant on my wound. So, who's your boss? We will still do the job. We are just curious. Oh, you accepted. Great. No one's my boss. The money was just a donation. Be believe it or not, there are still many Catholics around the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, and some of them are rich. Some of the people who gave me the money aren't even Christian. They just wanted to help a good cause. Uh, a few people over at Jabru were actually Buddhist or Shintoist, but they just respected my quest, you know? I just told them what I wanted to do and why it was important, and they trusted me. Religion is a good business, Calfan said and began stitching my leg. I sighed. Some use it that way, not gonna lie, MOTHERFUCKER! My leg hurt ten times more just for an instant. Hit a nerve, sorry, Calfan pleaded with a half-hidden smile. It was obvious he did it on purpose. But I am honest. I won't keep a single cent of the money and spend it all trying to restore the church. And if I have money remaining afterwards, I'll donate it to charities. Hmm, Oakley pondered, looking deeply into me. What do you say, Calfan? Can we believe him? If nothing else, he seems honest. I thought to myself, at least they appreciate honesty. Well, if you're gonna be part of the team, you need to know our names. Or the names we use, anyway. My name is Oakley. As you have seen, I am the close combat specialist. This grumpy man over here goes by Calfan. That's not my real name. He's the medic. But he's also got a lot of experience fighting in a certain revolution. Oakley! He screamed, for once not smiling. We don't say how we know what we know. There have been a bunch of revolutions all over the moons. It doesn't narrow it down. Still, don't say more about me. I won't, because now I have to talk about our leader, June. He does all the bossing around, but he's also an excellent sniper. Of people and ships, he, he can take down a two-person shuttle from orbit with a single shot. And finally, Sahira is our ship captain and mechanic. She makes sure to protect us from the vacuum outside. And now me, I announced. I am good at not losing fights. Uh, kinda, Oakley replied. Finally, our food arrived. It didn't look that good, but when I tasted it, I immediately remembered to give thanks to God because it was the best food I had had in months. Calfan got his to take away because the whole time he kept working on my leg and the other cuts I had in my arms. He was clearly a good doctor. 
it was a waste he didn't work at a hospital. 